everyone, and welcome back to the next webinar in our Plante Presents Global Plant Science Talk Series. My name is Katie Rogers, and I'm your host for today's webinar. This webinar series is brought to you today by Plante, the open online community for plant scientists, powered by the American Society of Plant Biologists. I'd like to give a special thank you to all of our ASPB members who are attending today. Your ASPB membership dues help support and make these webinars possible. For any of you who have not yet joined ASPB, you can join today and use the discount code PRESENTS10 to receive a 10% discount on registration. ASPB members get early access to these seminars. You can learn more about ASPB and the opportunities we provide at ASPB.org. Today's talk is the 16th Plante Present webinar in this series. If you haven't already done so, check out our archive to watch all the previous talks in this series. You can find information on our blog and subscribe to our YouTube channel. We're really glad to see you all here because we're trying something new with this new Plante Presents panel. Tonight and on the dates listed on this slide, we will have shorter seven minute talks featuring the work of four researchers. After their presentations, we will open a panel discussion for you to interact with our speakers. We hope this will allow us to include even more amazing presenters and make these webinars more interactive. Visit our website to learn more and apply to be a panelist. If you're having trouble connecting or need to leave the webinar early, know that a recording of this webinar will be made available along with all of the associated materials within a few days. If you have questions for our panelists, please let us know using the Zoom questions and answer section. You'll also notice that there is a chat area open. This section is for you to introduce yourselves, say where you're from, and connect with your colleagues. Questions that are specifically for our panelists should be shared in the Q&A section to make sure that they're easier for our moderator to navigate. Benjamin Swessinger, who is an ARC Future Fellow and Independent Group Leader at Australian National University, is with us today to moderate your questions and read them aloud to our panelists. Thank you all for joining. With that, we'll go ahead and start the videos. That's Sounds good. Thank you. I'm Dr. Fellow at the SOAP Institute in San Diego. In this short presentation, I'm going to talk about an unpublished study for my PhD training at the Max Planck Institute in Cologne, Germany. Studies in the past two decades have revealed that plants can reproducibly assemble characteristic microbial communities, the plant microbiota. And recent studies show some beneficial roles of the plant microbiota or plant health. For example, bacterial communities in the rhizosphere can protect plants from potentially pathogenic microbes in the soil. Thus, employing such beneficial traits of the plant microbiota could spur next generation breeding, but we still have limited knowledge about the molecular mechanisms underlying microbiota assembly and functions. A fundamental question related to this is, how do plants discriminate among surrounding microbes, such as bacterial species? So how do plants tell one bacterial strain from the others to selectively host and engage beneficial relationships with only some of them? To address this big question, we started with simple or important questions. First, do plants differently respond to different microbiota members? I call them commensal bacteria. And second, do plants differently influence on different commensal bacteria? We use a simplified experimental model called the monoassociation model, in which plants are inoculated with individual bacterial strains, and then we analyze transcriptomes of both plants and bacteria by RNA-seq. It used to be quite challenging to study bacterial transcriptomes in plants because of low abundance of bacterial RNA compared with plant RNA. But we recently developed a method by which we can enrich bacterial information from plant leaves to analyze transcriptomes and proteomes of bacteria in planta. This approach has been quite useful for us to study plant pathogen interactions, so we applied this method to study plant commensal interactions in this study. We use a variety of commensal strains covering all the major phyla of the plant microbiota. These commensal strains, which were originally isolated from wild Arabidopsis plants, were syringe infiltrated into Arabidopsis leaves, and six hours later, we harvested the samples and profiled transcriptomes of plants and bacteria. 
In the next several minutes, I will show some key results from this cold transcriptome study. Let's start with plant rna -seq data. The heat map shows gene expression fold changes between bacteria inoculated versus mock inoculated. As you can see, plant responses to different commensals are qualitatively similar. And these responses overlap well with typical immune response triggered by FRAG22. And plant immune-related genes were enriched in these two clusters. And when we look closer into these clusters, we find quantitative differences in the induction of these immune genes by different commensal strains. So a short answer to the first question is yes, to some extent. Plants induce different levels of immune responses against different commensals. Now let's talk about bacterial rna -seq data. Here I summarize expression changes of bacterial functions either up or down regulated in planta compared with in vitro, which is a nutrient-rich medium. Here I want to focus on a couple of functions. The first is translation. In this box plot, each dot represents a gene encoding the ribosome or protein. We found that those genes were globally suppressed in planta in all of the commensals tested in this study. In contrast, the opposite pattern was observed in a virulent pathogen, Pseudomonas syringi, DC3000, or PTO, which can aggressively grow in the Arabidopsis. Interestingly, a non virulent mutant of PTO, B36C, showed suppression in these genes, resembling commensal strains. And B36C doesn't grow much in plants. So there is a correlation between bacterial growth in planta and expression of these genes. So what can be extrapolated from here is Growth of commensal strains is commonly suppressed in plants, which is in line with the notion that commensals do not typically overgrow in healthy plants. So our transcriptome data of a variety of commensal strains could capture biologically relevant bacterial status in plants. This is an example of strain-specific regulation of bacterial functions. Bacterial motility genes were induced in this beta proteobacterial strain while suppressed in this alpha proteobacterial strain. And a similar pattern was observed in the pathogen PTO. So some commensals can respond like a pathogen in particular functions. And we found many more functions that are regulated in strain specific manners. So a short answer to the second question is also yes, different bacterial strains respond differently in plants. So the take-home message from this short presentation is transcription responses of plants and commensals are bacterial strain specific. So interactions between plants and the microbiota are comprised of these unique interactions between microbiota members and the host. Deeper understanding of each interaction will be important to address the question, how do plants discriminate among surrounding microbes? And I hope our call transcriptome data set and the approach are useful for addressing this fundamental question. It is also important to note that these interactions are not simply additive, because micro-micro interactions can also indirectly affect plant microbe interactions, making things more complicated. So unweaving such complexity in the context of natural environments will be an important future challenge for us. Lastly, Adding further complexity is heterogeneity in plant microbe interactions. Plant responses to the microbiota are likely cell type specific, and microbiota distribution is also heterogeneous in plants. So it is likely that there are many more unique and locally structured interactions between plant cells and microbial cells. And I believe we will need this level of resolution to better understand the molecular mechanisms underlying microbiota assembly and functions. And that's something I'm currently working on as a postdoc by employing and developing a suite of single cell technologies. With this, I want to thank to the co-authors, especially my former PI, Ken Tsuda, and I also acknowledge my current PI, Joy Kerr. Thank you for listening. Hey everybody, my name is Kara Levin, and today I'm going to be talking to you about getting to the root of the serial cyst nematode infections in wheat. This project was done at the University of Adelaide in Adelaide, Australia. Many of us know the crop species wheat because of its many products that we love. 
And as plant scientists, we know how important roots are to our plant species. But what many of um, people may not, not know is that underground, there is a pathogen that causes severe yield loss in wheat, especially here in Australia. This pathogen is called the cereal cyst nematode, and it's microscopic and can infect um, wheat roots and cause these sad looking wheat species. So how does it do this? The nematode will um, infect just at the tip of the plant root, and it will make its way into the vascular tissue where it will pick a single cell to begin its feeding site. In this feeding site, it will eject infector proteins, and these are going to break down the neighboring cell walls to create this large sink of cells that the nematode will then continue to grow and feed off of until it bursts out um, and becomes what is known as the cyst, which will encase all of its eggs that will then stay in the soil and repeat this process. The aim of my project was to try to understand better this parasitic interaction, and to do that, I wanted to better visualize these nematode feeding site development over time. Um, the, a bit of literature background. So the way that um, the, we, these have always been studied has been in two-dimensional microscopic images. So in these images in transvert sections, you get a good idea of um, the location as far as where next to the vascular tissue here. And here is the central metaxylem in wheat. And then this is the large feeding site, which contains multiple cells. And here's another example. So here is the vascular tissue, the central metaxylem here, and the feeding site here. And when you look at the longitudinal sections, um, you can get an idea of the length of these feeding sites. But when you look at these two dimensional images, you don't really get a great idea of um, its relative space within the root and kind of the uh, 3D shape of these feeding sites. So I wanted to create a 3D image of these nematode feeding sites. And to do that, I would take the infected root tissue, I would clear it in an agent called Clear C, and then I would embed an agro so that I could take some really thick sections. So in this case, I was taking 150 micron sections, and then I would stain this with my confocal dyes. And using my confocal microscope, I would then take a Z stack, so this is the laser taking images at different focal points and then stacking that all together to create this 3D image. Now, when I did that, um, so this is an example of a control root. So this has not been infected with nematodes. You see the vascular tissue here, and then this is that central metaxylem tube um, that runs throughout the wheat root. And you can see it's um, a large empty tube as we would expect. When I look at my infected tissue, um, we found something really interesting in that we would start to see this long central metaxylem tube, but then we would run into a series of very bulbous cells that still maintained their cell uh, wall vessels. Um, and this was something that we weren't expecting, had not seen before, and had not read about that in the literature. Um, and so we wanted to investigate exactly what was happening here. In order to investigate uh, the development of these central metaxylems, I use a program called Amaris, and in Amaris we can then select the cells we wanted to look at. So in this case, I'm just selecting the central metaxylem, um, and then I could make that into a model that I could then pull out and use it to kind of turn around, look at different ways, and see the structure, whether it's hollow. Um, and so I did this with a control root and then with an infected root over time. And what I found was in our control route, um, these cells would mature by first elongating. So they remained these um, vessel cell walls. And then eventually, so by day 15 and 21, these walls would degrade and they would basically mature into the lignified xylem uh, tube that we know as the central metaxylem. In the infected development, what we found was instead of elongating um, long-wise, these would instead become very plump. So they were elongating width-wise. Um, and we found that even as far as day 21, they would remain these um, 
vessel cell walls. Um, and so when you're thinking about the central metazylum as carrying water, this is a very interesting finding that the nematode might be doing. So our theory for this is that instead of um, these cells progressing as a normal development, there might be signaling coming from the nematode that are stopping these cells from going through the program cell death and becoming mature walls because before they mature, these are actually um, large sources of nutrients because of the large cell size. So we think that the nematode might be hijacking kind of that system of development to keep these cells um, from maturing to use as part of their feeding site and possibly also as basically um, a reserve bank for where the uh, water flow would come and they kind of have that as a feeding reserve bank um, next to near their feeding sites. If you want to find out more, you can read about it in my scientific reports. Um, this just came out. Um, so definitely have a look there and look at some more of the images that I have in that paper. Um, and with that, I'd just like to acknowledge all of these people here and thank you very much for your time. Hello, I'm Luis Alcaraz and I'm here to present Marcanto Microbiomes, already published in scientific reports, and here are my contact details if you need to reach me for comments. Marcantia are liverwoods, bryophytes at the basal group of the first land plants. They managed to colonize land some 450 million years ago. It is now a cosmopolitan group of plants. They are dioic, so separate sexes, totally dependent on water for reproduction with no real stomata, but gas pores, rhizoids instead of roots, and they are haploid during most of the life cycle. The liverworts was the first plants to establish microbial associations and the first to establish plant-fungi interaction in symbiotic ways. Little was known about what were the key bacteria interacting with Marcantia, which is a plant with the longest evolutionary times of land living, so we decided to do some research. Then, the two-step model is important for soil-plant interactions, which are key for plant establishment, distinguishing friends from foes, and the model for those interactions has been proposed, that is this one. So, the model, Propose that the soil, here known as edaphic factors, has the largest bacterial diversity. Then the microbes are filtered away by rhizo deposits and cellular features, like cellulose, for example, which are general to multiple plant species. This is the first step. Then a second step, filtering the plant inhabitant microbes in a host specific way, which is known as the second step, and it has to be with plant immune recognition. To study the Mercantia microbiomes, we decided to first describe soil microbiomes through 16S ribosomal RNA gene amplicons to describe its microbial sources. Then, we collected wild plants from two St. Patrick Marcantia species, Marcantia polyacea and Marcantia polymorpha, and described their microbiomes. Using two plant species from the same genus enabled us to study host specific signals. Additionally, Marcantia is now a model species cultivated in growth media and we decided to describe the in vitro Marcantia microbiomes because if bacteria were surviving to cereal culture of the plant in vitro, they must be tightly associated to the plants in an extreme selection for their bacterial inhabitants. So the plant's microbiome, specifically the root-associated micro microbiome, has been shown to have dramatic effects on plant establishment survival and access to nutrients, given the anatomical structure of Marcantias, Tali, also containing single cell rhizoids, would be the equivalent of microbiome profiles obtained from both root and phylosphere in vascular plants. So it's an excellent model. Two well plants were collected in situ and they were St. Patrick. This means they co-live in the same area. So, the Marcantia microbiome diversity, here's the phylogenetic profile for both Marcantia species, and we describe it 36,000 operational taxonomic units or OTUs in our study. The soil from both species, 
here and here have a similar bacterial diversity. They collected well plants as well, which are here and here. But the in vitro specimens that you can see in these bars and these ones had significantly lower diversity. In the top, you can see the Shannon diversity index for soil wild and in vitro, soil wild and in vitro. And notice that Marcantia palaeasia wild is similar to its soil source, drastically reducing its diversity in vitro, which is kind of the same pattern. Then we compare the Mercantia microbiomes to multiple plant species to evaluate the microbiome relatedness and they were all dominated by proteobacteria as you can see here, which is the pale blue. I can, I'm showing you here a weighted unitract distances dendrogram and each terminal node represents a bacterial community and Mercantia palaeasia is closer to its soil source following the two-step model while Marcantia polymorpha wild plants it's not clustering with its soil source. The in vitro communities are clustering in a clade apart from the rest. So now visualizing these bacterial communities in the northern nation, you can notice that Paleasia, which is represented by dots here, are closer to each other. And in the other case, Polymorpha it's far away from its soil and the wild plants and the in vitro plants, which previous work had described that some Marcantia polymorpha are impaired for mycorrhizae formation with glomeric mycota and fungi due to several mutations in symbiotic genes like DMA1, 3, and APD3. The lower polymorpha diversity could be reflecting this loss of symbiotic capabilities, and this is also observed in some domesticated plants. Then, we used this information and our approach allowed us to identify a core of shared bacterial OTUs as a part of the Marcante microbiome. Additionally, we found significantly enriched bacteria in each of the tested microbiomes, so soil, wild, and in vitro. This allowed us to identify the following bacteria, like Methylobacterium, Rhizobium, Penibacillus, and Citrobacter as part of the core microbiome. Additionally, hundreds of bacteria enriched in wild plants compared to the soil origins. The case of Methylobacterium is interesting as it can survive in single carbon sources like methanol and methylamine and are probably consuming it from plants. Methylobacterium is probably accumulating within the plant air chambers. We suggest that methylotrophic bacteria enrichments are due to bacterial niche opportunity and a specialization found in the Mercantia air chambers. We also identify general plant growth promoting bacteria like Rhizobia and Methylobacterium, and other ones capable of organic compound degrading like Penibacillus, Steroidobacter, and Lysobacter. We also identify within the core multiple interaction roles from essential mutualistic commands on pathogenic bacteria regulating populations and the community. So due to Mercantia's phylogenetic position and long-term symbiotic interactions, these bacteria are probably key to all plant interactions being a core for most of the land plants. Thank you and for the details you can check out our paper. Thank you so much. Thank you, Plante, for the opportunity to present a short talk. My name is Derek Lundberg, and I'm a postdoc in the Weigel Lab, tubing in Germany. And my name is Prachaya. I have finished my master program and now work in the Weigel Lab. So in nature, as you know, that the plants differ in microbial load, and each color represents the different types of the microbes. As you can see here, the purple and yellow See, they have the same amount of the microbe across these five plants, but the blue is increasing. And here is what people usually do, is that to use 16SR and amplicon sequencing to observe the microbial abundance. And by doing that, they calculate the parameter called compositional abundance or relative abundance that scale everything up to 100%. And here is a problem. When you look at the sample five, the yellow and purple have a fewer amounts in comparison to 
uh, sample one, which, which leads us to misinterpret and calculate the form of microbial abundance. This problem of compositional abundance is well known and requires special, special statistics. However, uh, none of these statistical methods can tell you for sure uh, what is actually happening in terms of which microbes are decreasing or which are increasing across samples. For this, you need real experimental data on microbial load. One way to get this data is to use spike in DNA. For example, a synthetic 16S gene added based on the sample mass or area. To do that, you have to first measure the sample mass or area, which has measurement errors, and pipette in the spike in, which has pipetting errors associated. Another option is quantitative PCR, but then you have to set up a separate reaction, which uses sometimes more than double the sample. Also has pipetting errors, which add noise, and it can quantify off-target amplicons, like plastids. Uh, you can also use colony counting, but this requires fresh sample. It's vulnerable to pipetting errors, and only culturable microbes uh, can be quantified. Finally, it's a lot of work. So potential solution that we could use is that uh, whole metagenomic sequencing to get all the information from microbes and also from plants. But in reality, we get all the information from plants, and that is the case for the area biopsis that we, we get around 95% of the total reads that become wasteful. And it's even more wasteful when we work on the bigger plant genome, like wheat, that has around 16 gigabits. So what Prachai and I have done is create HAM, -PCR, PCR, which is host-associated micro-PCR. It's a two-step amplicon sequencing protocol. In the first step, which is two cycles, called the tagging step, we have uh, two primer pairs, or four primers in the same tube. Two are specific to the host, and two specific to the microbe. These primers add the same forward universal overhang and the same reverse universal overhang. That means that when we go to the PCR step of 30 cycles, a single primer pair, which can bind to these universal overhangs, can now amplify these diverse templates using the same annealing sequence, therefore without bias. And that is the case for the ham PCR when we get uh, two amplicon types. So the first type is uh, for host, and the second type is for the microbes. And that way, we will we, we be able to calculate the microbial abundance based on the normalized or equal host amount. Furthermore, because we use a single copy host gene, the amount of plant DNA is manageable. And with that, uh, we can apply the ham PCR with uh, three ampli uh, three primers. So the first primer is for host, and the less is for bacteria, and in this case, we apply to oomycete. So we did a simple experiment where we infected Arabidopsis thaliana with um, Pseudomonas syringae DC3000, a bacterial pathogen, and Hyloperinospora arabidopsidis, an oomycete pathogen. And we infected wild-type plants, and immunocompromised plants where we expect the oomycete to grow. Um, when we look at the relative abundance of only the 16S, first of all, we don't see any oomycete because the 16S primers can't amplify them. And next, we see, yes, the bacterial pathogen, but we don't see a difference between the wild type and the immunocompromised plants. And the uninfected plants, we see a diversity of bacterial families. Using ham PCR, which takes into account the host abundance, we see a very different story. First, we can see the oomycete because we use an additional primer pair to detect it. We also see the bacterial pathogen. We clearly see the immunocompromised plants have higher microbial load. Most strikingly, we see that the uninfected plants have extremely low microbial load. And Therefore, you can see that on the top, when you scale everything to 100%, it looks like the abundance of some of these families is much higher than it actually is. So in our paper, we have compared ham PCR with some trusted methods, uh, with colony counting, uh, with quantitative PCR, and the results are comparable. We also used 
uh, metagenome, whole metagenome sequencing to calculate the load and correlated that with our ham PCR results. And you can see we have a good correlation. So in summary, the host associated micro PCR or ham PCR can be used to investigate the colonization and the infection of the crop plants, including other plants, and also it can apply to bees and other insects. And that can also be used to monitor the cryptic or symptomless infections, and also can track for the quantitative mixed infection study. Also, it is useful for simpler statistical and network analysis of microbiome data. So we published this and many more details in our preprints on BioArchive. Uh, please check it out. Um, so again, I'm Derek Lemberg, and this is Prachaya, and we'd like to thank you. So that's our, our final video, and I'd like to thank all of our speakers for submitting videos. Um, that was really fun. I think we probably all really want one of these whiteboards that they had now. <laughs> Um, so Derek and Prachaya are asleep right now, so it's 3.30 a.m. their time in Germany, but all of our other panelists are here on the line to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, so I'm Ben, I'm your host today. Um, I'm at the Australian National University, and while we maybe wait for a couple more questions to come in, um, I will briefly introduce everybody like once again, um, so we make sure we can match up uh, these faces. Um, so First of all, the first speaker was uh, Tatsuya Nabori. N Nobori. Um, he was talking yes. about the dissecting the code of descriptional landscape of plants and microbes. You would briefly wave. Tatsuya Nobori is an AF HFSP uh, postdoctoral fellow in the lab of Joe Ecker at the Salk Institute at San Diego, and he completed his PhD in the group of Kenji Tsuda at the Max Planck Institute Cologne in 2019. His current research interest is to understand plant microbe interactions at a single cell level. I mean, we'll touch on this in a minute, but let's go on uh, to introduce uh, Karen Levin. Maybe wave briefly. Kara. Uh, she is getting to the root of serial cyst nematodes infections in wheat. Kara recently received her PhD in plant genetics and pathology from the University of Adelaide. She started a plant science journey at the University of Maryland, working as a plant of plant in plant physiology lab as an undergrad. She then worked in a plant pathogen laboratory at the UCS USDA before deciding to move to wonderful Adelaide, Australia, to study the effects of plant parasitic nematodes and weed. Uh, thank you, uh, Kara. Then it's very exciting also to have somebody from South America, finally. Uh, you've been waiting way too long. So we had Luis Alcaraz. Do you want to wave briefly, Luis? Yep, here. Yeah. And so Luis, he presented work on Macantia liverworts as a proxy to plants basal, basal microbiomes. And Luis Alcaraz is a full time professor at the Faculty of Science, the University of Nacional Autonoma de Mexico. Sorry if I didn't pronounce as well. His lab's research topics are environmental genomics, molecular microbiology, and comparative genomics. The main research interest is um, microbe host interaction, and they have funded research in plant associated microbes and metagenomics. And last but not least, the people who couldn't show up because they're uh, fast asleep in Germany on the other side of the planet. Uh, it's Tarek Lundberg and Pradashi Pramori Na Atushia. Um, they were talking about host associated micro PCR, ham PCR. Pradashi was born in Thailand and studied biology at Chula Longorn University. He recently completed his master's in biochemistry at the University of Tübingen and completing a thesis, a PhD thesis, I presume, in the lab of Dedlick Weigel. He continues to work in the Weigel lab, both in microbiome topics and biochemistry of plant resistance protein. He's, current, uh, he's currently applying for PhD position. So if you want to hire smart people, uh, that's one way to do it. And then Tarek S. Lindberg was born in the US and studied biology at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, also at UN, UNCCH. He received his PhD studying the Arabidopsis 
Taliana Root Microbiome, advised by Jeff Dengel. Since 2014, he has been a postdoc in the Weigel lab, working primarily on the leaf microbiome. He's currently searching for faculty or group leader position. All right. So, great. Thank you very much, uh, everyone, for actually submitting something. And it's exciting also that we have really people from different uh, continents, which was part of this idea, really, to bring people together from different places and capture more diversity and open it up a little bit more. And we hope in future we will have like many more um, submissions. Uh, and also, I think kind of as it all came out too, is that we hope maybe like in half a year, a year, a couple of years time, people will just say, oh yeah, I gave a plant a presents talk. And afterwards I had a chat with a colleague and now I have a collaboration. So that's kind of like what we try to uh, he achieve here, especially for people who maybe like are not in the center of um, Western science, but like uh, South America, for example, who create science, we don't hear it often enough about them. So it brings these people in and, and really strengthens this collaboration together uh, between people. So that's kind of the idea. And we know that from the other talks, people already had collaboration starting so this is a new platform where we just want to enable more people to get the same advantages really and of course if you are a PhD student or a postdoc or a master student and you're on the job market I think it's also a great opportunity all right so we have a bunch of questions um, but we start really light <laughs> so we start really light because you as a trail place as you kind of the trend that is thank you very much for submitting actually something so I had a quick go around maybe how did you actually like it what was the challenge and yeah what was what, what the challenge uh, pre uh, preparing this seven minutes talk and what do you like about it and maybe we start with Louis and then just go around okay okay good morning good night whatever you are <laughs> um, depending on where you are and it was pretty challenging for, for, for us we were talking about this before starting and it, it's challenging to try to uh, talk about everything you think it's relevant in just seven minutes and you need to practice a lot and I think it's a good exercise because you can cover multiple talks and learn a lot in a reduced span of time and if you want to learn further details you can ask the people read the papers but I guess it's a real nice way to present your work to most people no? so thank you for for organizing this for me it was challenging it's not my native language so it's say everything say it fast but not so fast so it's funny that's it thank you Luis yeah and that was also one idea we had just to briefly comment on this that we wanted to enable the people to submit videos so the people who might be not in the native language could really practice and really give a polished talk without having to struggle and feeling maybe a little bad that they mispronounced something, which I do all the time and I feel bad about it, but anyway. So, uh, Tatsuya, do you would like to comment on how it was and such? Yeah, same here, seven minutes, um, putting all the, relevant data and conceptual things, as well as introduction in seven minutes was quite challenging. Actually, I when I recorded a video, I ran over, my presentation was like nine minutes. So I edited to cut out some additional parts and you might uh, have noticed in, in my video, uh, some weird part, but um, that was the most uh, challenging part, I guess. Cool, thank you. And Kara, how was your experience? Yeah, I agree. Um, definitely found it difficult. And I think I'm maybe not as tech savvy uh, because I could, I, if I ran over time, just had to redo it again. <laughs> um, so yeah, and I think, um, you know, when you're giving a live talk, you can kind of feed off of people's energy and maybe make some eye contact and make it a bit more exciting. Um, versus, you know, you catch yourself when you're just doing um, a video and recording it. Um, I think you kind of lose a little bit of that um, pizzazz when you're doing it. Um, so that makes it difficult to kind of, you know, keep going. It feels like you're doing a practice run or something. So. Yep. Cool, thanks. I think you all did like really amazing jobs and I'm actually 
I'm really happy, Matt, really happy. I had a little bit of a downer this morning. So actually listening to all of you and all these different talks was, was very exciting. So thank you. Thank you for that. Lifted my day up. So uh, maybe I have a, we have a couple of questions. Um, and maybe we just post these individual questions first. And then I have, or we have some real general questions where we hopefully lead to a little bit of a discussion. Maybe I just start with uh, Tatsuya. So I think I really like your technique with the RNA seq of the pathogen implanter. Um, I think it's pretty like revolutionary, um, which is nice. And so you found this ribosomal proteins. So do you think which are downregulated in your commensals? So versus not in your pathogens, and we kind of related it to the growth. So do you think the, these ribosomal proteins are mostly in kind of involved in a translation, transcription, uh, and such? And that was the one question. And the other question which came in was, to how, what do you actually compare it to? Because you compared it, I think, to steady state growth or like or exponential growth like like what was the comparison actually made towards um so for the first question yes i think um the suppression rib ribosomal protein reflects a uh, like a suppression of metabolic activity which could be a growth or maybe you know activity which kind of fights back against plants uh, or whatever you know doing whatever in plants and the second question, I didn't quite understand. So what's, um, so the question is asking what I compared. I mean the, yes, so because you had this, so you show, I think you have this lock fold, you, I try to remember this, you had this lock fold expression or something where you compared the implanter expression to something else. And I think the question was, what do you actually compare it to? So what's his uh, steady oh, state okay, okay. of the bacteria? Uh, or... So this is a comparison between implanta uh, gene expression versus in vitro, which is a rich medium. And I took, um, yes, log experimental phase, which varies between species. So first we made a growth curve of bacteria and set the, um, the time, we, time point uh, to sample. So we are looking at the phase where bacteria actively grow. So if, yeah, it answers the question. Cool, thank you. There are more questions for you, but I will go on first and then um, we might come back to you. Kara, it was really nice because the first talk was really like this molecular biology and transcription. And then your talk was really about cellular responses of the host towards like microbes, which um, it's nice also to have these different views when we have such a panel. So the question which came in here was about, um, so you show this different cell morphology in response to the nematodes. Do you think this is an active manipulation by the nematode or a sec like, like an indirect secondary effect by changes in other cells or changes in the nutrient status or transpiration rate or anything else? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So we kind of saw this and had the same question, you know, is this um, a host response that's kind of protecting itself from this attack or is this a nematode induced um, kind of signaling happening? And I think it's a little bit hard to judge which is which, is which because it could be a host reaction to a specific nematode signaling. And so then you kind of get caught up in chicken and eggs kind of stuff. Um, but what's really exciting about this work is that um, I've kind of continued uh, this piece of the project and we found that this reaction, this cell morphology reaction is less severe in um, resistant cultivars. So you see less of this um, kind of bubbling reaction happening um, when the plant is resistant to that infection. So to me, that's a huge signal that this is in fact something that the nematode is inducing and is more so um, a benefit for the nematode in some way. Cool, thank you. Super interesting um, stuff. Right, so let's move on to everybody gets a question. Um, to Liz, sorry, I probably pronounced your name wrong. Sorry about that. Um, so, there were two questions kind of 
related. So you showed that you have in vitro, you actually still have a microbiome. So were these plants actually grown from seed and axenically or like surface sterilized or was this like a transplant from the soil? That was the first question. And the other question, you kind of ended up on that some of these microbiome components potentially are part of all plant, like um, land plant microbiomes. Can you comment a little bit on this later part too? See, these two questions. Yeah. Thank you, Benjamin. You, the, Louis is okay, whatever you can get it. Uh, so the, the thing with these plants is that they are haploid most of the lifetime. Um, so the, the, the original plants were, um, the, the researchers we we're collaborating with, they collected from the wild and they have been culturing it exenically across generations in the lab. But the thing to do the in vitro microbiomes is that Mario Arteaga's group noticed that from time to time they have bacterial growth in the petri dishes growing Marcantia. And if you try to get axenic plants with loads of antibiotics, you end up killing the plant as well. So it seems that it's a nice serial passes experiment, like the experimental evolution setups where you perform like multiple serial passes in an extreme selection uh, of the of your microbes of the ones that are capable to uh, be transgenerationally within the plants or you can get them in your from your environment maybe during the manipulation you can get uh, spores from some bacilli species or something like that uh, but the thing is like this is a very nice way to do uh, core microbiome questions because you're comparing wild plants against some in vitro plants and you find like the soil sources and you can find out like key microbes uh, not wasting loads of money in I don't know hundreds of replicates but in the design of we are comparing the microbial the main microbial source the soil and then the, the wild plants and the in vitro and find out that the species found in the whole set of plants we analyze are common to beneficial microbes to to all bacteria and the, the plant is a few cells layer thick and you can have a mixture of the microbiomes from phyllospheres from from leaves in plants in vascular plants and roots but just sharing the space in a few cells block of plants so we are proposing this so it, it seems like a nice model to test these kind of features and the plant doesn't have real stomata so they have like these air chambers and they're totally dependent on water for living for reproduction and so the bacteria we found there so it's a nice place to test these theories of core microbiomes yes uh thank you very much hmm. all right so i thought the next question I have for you, does anybody have a question to each other's talks? Does anybody have a question? You're probably always sitting like, oh my God, <laughs> like listen to myself is a real challenge. <laughs> so never mind, but I just like thought I, I open it up to you. And so the last couple of minutes, I thought we kind of maybe hopefully as a group, so you can maybe we can all just like keep the mic on or so discuss a little bit like these general questions of the field. So a little bit like, where do you see the field going? Uh, the, and also we saw very different approaches here used to study kind of the same thing, like this, like microbiome or like a host interactions and so on. And that is a, for me a little bit the microbiome feels and microbiome feels is kind of like people come in from really different angles. So there's this really classic MPMI like, um, molecular plant microbe interactions where people come more from the molecular biology and then there's also people like from the evolutionary side where in ecology we're really like going out and sampling like in environments and ecosystems and then maybe bring different theories together and so and also then of course like the cellular biology it's all also coming in so there's all these different fields kind of coming together which i think makes it really exciting but also like a challenging of course and so the one question I have for all of you, like, so where do you think the whole field moves? And of course, what you do probably <laughs> addresses some of these questions already. 
And so how can she, and the other question, how can she subfields which kind of clash together, learn from each other? So can we learn from evolutionary theory, if we come from molecular biology, or can we do learn from cell biology if we address this question? So like a little really open question. And I thought maybe if somebody wants to chip in and then we hopefully get a small discussion going and maybe we get another question from the Q&A. Does somebody want to take the leap? to get this very loaded question. Luis, yeah. Okay. Yeah, go I, ahead. I was just waving. I, I was not asking for it. So, <laughs> uh, so I, I really enjoy both of your talks and, uh, and the one from, from Lundberg and his collaborator. And I guess it, it's a lot of learning process going on. I really enjoyed your, your videos about the 3D section about this infection. And I was wondering that for, for us, it's like a black box because of the extraction methods. We just destroy everything, put everything all together. And we are not, well, my group is not into the fine location of the microbes within the cell. And it's like really interesting to, to find out that, that thing. And I guess that we need to talk to each other more to find interesting collaborations because I have no technical skills to perform what Kara does. And, and the Tatsuya talk, it's, it's really, really amazing because it's like, I don't know, mixing the, the RNA-seq and, and the cross-talking between the microbes and the plant in just one point. And then the, the PCR, the ham PCR is like, okay, if you're measuring this, you need to normalize, which is already known, but it's really interesting how to, how we can be misled to interpret our results if we do not take cautions about uh, technical issues that could totally bias our biological interpretation. So I, I, I really enjoy the, the, the talks on the forum and I don't know, I, w I was wondering that there's no one that is asking everything in the microbe world. No? So there, there's, I, I, I know, I do not know any group that is working from the soil then connected to the rhizosphere and then the, the protozoa uh, and the nematodes and the amoeba <laughs> all, all together in the soil group eating and foraging from each other and the bacteria and the plants and then the transcripts mixing all together. So it's a kind of a mess and we are just building it up from, from the bottom now. So I don't know, that, that, that's my reflection. I really enjoy your talks. I, I, I have, I, I don't know if I can ask something cool about your presentations now, but I, I, I was really, thinking about how to mix everything together. And I guess that's the general feeling of all, all of us right now. Yeah, I, I definitely agree. I think um, a lot of us, like when we do our PhDs, we kind of um, are thrown into this deep end and we need to find something that we're gonna build a skill set in. And you can't do everything. So I think um, kind of what I've learned through that process is uh, when you need to learn a new technique or you, you know, want to reach out and do something you've never done before, you need to have some, you need to, you can't do it yourself. You need to be able to reach out and have somebody. Um, and I think that building a community like this is really important because there's nothing stopping, you know, any of you guys from sending me something or me sending you something to work on and building some kind of collaboration, you know, what, is going to take me a month to learn how to do the file of the genetics and you know build up those um, maps uh, is going to take you a day so yeah I think building these kind of collaborations and you know making papers like that is something that you know it would only take me about a day to build some kind of model like that whereas you know everyone would start from ground zero so I think it's really important yeah to to build these collaborations yeah, speaking about those interdisciplinary collaborations, I'm particularly excited about the integration of genomics and cell biology recently. As you know, genomics in microbiome research tells you, you know, who who are there, which what kind of microbes are there, and like host RNA seq can tell you what the plant is doing, but it doesn't tell much about where 
are those old bacteria uh, sitting in plants and which plant cells are responding in which way. And this, you know, exactly where the cell biology can chip in and, um, and you know, detailed imaging analysis can really link the spatial uh, information of plant bacteria and uh, plant microbial interactions. So I think we will see more and more this kind of uh, collaborative uh, projects, um, the cell biology and uh, genomics and microbiome study. And it would be nice if we can start such collaboration um, from, I don't know, from this plant crowd. Um, Yeah. Cool. Thank you. Maybe I have one last question for you before we have to wrap up. So, of course, it means like at least 10 perspectives are actually about then to exploit the changes in microbiome or what we learn in terms of microbiome to engineer potentially new microbiomes or to biocontrol agents to actually improve agriculture. Like, what is your take on that? How far is it away? Is it possible? Or is it just like an, an illusion and we will never get there? That's who yes, it should start. No? <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah I, yeah, I should say we are still far from really, you know, bringing microbiome to really improve the agriculture we still don't know the rules uh, behind microbiome assembly and functions we started to see some beneficial functions of microbiome but we don't know how it's expressed um, so without knowing this it's kind of difficult to engineer it but um, yeah but uh, what I see in the future is really an engineering of both plant side and bacterial side uh, microbial side Sorry, I, I love bacteria, so I keep saying bacteria. <laughs> um, so, you know, recent technologies like um, cell type specific, plant cell type specific gene editing or um, um, optogenetic mod, uh, manipulation, these, these techniques will tell us how to breed, um, how to kind of engineer cell type specific regulation in plants uh, in crops. And also we can uh, manipulate microbial community, just adding your favorite bacterial strain to the community and with adding chemicals, which are not, which are harmless, but can change microbiome behavior as you wish. So combining these techniques, I hope we can, you know, see some real world application of microbiome, of microbiome interactions. Um, yeah, that's yeah my comment. I think um, if we look at kind of different fields of science and kind of what they're doing there, um, when I think about the microbiome, um, like evolutionary wise, I kind of compare that to what we know about human microbiome and like gut microbiome and what the what they're doing there and what kind of studies we know there, and we really don't know a lot. Uh, actually, and what the major effects are. There's very, very beginning studies um, of kind of how much the microbiome of the human affects everything, the way that our brain functions, everything. So I think if we use that as kind of a model of where we can go with plant, I think that we can have some really revolutionary takes, but I still think that we're uh, really, really far away. But I think it's definitely the right field to be in. <laughs> So I guess we need to know a, a lot more, but there, there are the different approaches going to, to build synthetic communities right now. And in, even in the human microbiome, people are doing crazy stuff like the fecal transplants. Like, that, that they're crazy. That. They don't know really how they are working, but <laughs> they take healthy poop from one individual, then transplant it into a patient with a, a irritable bowel syndrome or something like that and then yeah. boom it works but the the, the the problematic thing about it it works by magic it's like sometimes you have issues no and, and the, those kind of transplants they have diseased people right now from something that went wrong with plants you have a lot of more experimental Less, less liability with, with doing these kind of experiments. 
but I guess we're in the we're right now moving from the traditional uh, plant growth promoting bacteria one single isolate will do the whole difference and moving from you no know, that when you inoculate those microbes into the field they got engulfed by everyone else no so you need to think into building communities and I guess we are starting to build some insights and gain some knowledge about how things are working what is normal what is diseases so we need to learn a lot there's a lot of work to, to be done but i guess that the, the future is going into building these gene repositories maybe from the synthetic biology point of view uh, and from the evolutionary perspective maybe try to assemble whole communities you know that could be work together into inoculate some plants so that's my take on that cool thank you that brings us to the hour and uh you made my day so i'm super happy <laughs> also thank you for the trailblazing and do uh actually joining us so that was uh Tatsuya Nobori talking about co-description landscape of plants and microbiota, Carol Levin about getting to the root of sterile cyst nematodes infections weed, Louis Alcaraz uh, Macantia liver boards as a proxy to plant spatial microbiomes, Jack Lundberg and Pradashi Atsuyaya uh, with host as used micro PCR, they couldn't make it because they were sleeping. But thank you really, really much, uh, very much for actually being the spearheaders and trendsetters here. And thank you. Yeah, thank you all for joining. We had people who woke up as early as 7 a.m. and people who stayed up as late as 11 p.m. for this. And then this will be posted on our YouTube. So you'll have the chance too to see this as a recording. And I'm sure a lot of the people that are hopefully asleep right now, we'll get the chance to see it as well. Um, if you're interested in, I, I, I've put a slide up with information about our next panels. Um, we'd love to have submissions from you. So please um, give that a thought and send us submissions. Thank you all for joining. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you, see you. Thank you. Greetings.